as you see, we've spent some time designing the slides. Uh, hope you like them. Uh, okay, so today we'd like to talk to you about putting function back in function as a service. Okay. Uh, sorry. Whoops. Doesn't work. Uh, okay. I would like you to look at a picture uh, showing the evolution of, a, of an architecture. So, say you have an e-commerce venture, you have a shop selling, I don't know, shoes. Uh, so you start off with a, with a very simple architecture. You basically uh, run your server on an e EC2 instance somewhere. Uh, it's just a single server. It serves your requests well. Well, right up to a point where it stops scaling and, well, you need to, I don't know, add a second server, right? put a load balancer uh, before them, then add a separate RDS instance so that you know you can scale the DB separately. And this is like, this is a few major services. But then the time comes when you, ha you you'll have so many requests that even this stops responding. You basically start losing requests, losing customers, so you think, huh, I know what to do. We'll do microservices, okay? So you put some API gateway, you split different functionalities onto different services uh, so that you know have some separation of concerns uh, you add more rds instances you add some analytics pipelines redshift for for analytics data um, okay and this this works this scales this is this is better and what can we do next what's what's next is there a finer uh, level of of granulation well turns out there is and it we think it's serverless. Uh, so ideally, the, the finest way in which you can subdivide your computation is different functions. And when you deploy functions separately, this is, this is the ideal situation. Uh, functions are good to reason about. Functions are, um, well, if you, if you build per function, you can actually really optimize it, and it's very cost effective. Uh, well, so. To, to sum this up, we subdivide our computations, we separate the responsibilities, and we manage to reduce cost, increase performance, increase scalability, okay? But nothing's for free, right? We are also increasing complexity. Now we have, I don't know, hundreds of deployable entities that we need to worry about. This is, this is a huge cost, and this is moving this cost from the operations people onto the developers. So. How, how, can we, how can we manage this complexity, okay? And I would like you to look at this picture again. Now, I have some blocks visualizing different services. Now, when I deploy functions, what's my visualization? Well, my claim here is that this visualization of deployed functions is a graph where each node is a function and each edge is the, the, the flow of data between the functions, right? And it just so happens that we are working on this uh, solution for visual textual programming, which does exactly that. I, I hope you can see something. Uh, the, the contrast's not the best. Anyway, it's a, it's a text editor. When you type a program, and it automatically translates into a graph. And conversely, you can develop using the graph. And the program is pretty much typing itself. Uh, so let me show you a quick demo of how this works. Uh, only, the, only the visual part, uh, because it's argu arguably cooler. I mean, we've all seen textual languages. Uh, yeah, so the basic idea is that you start off with some data that you get from an endpoint, and you start applying subsequent transformations, perhaps viewing the data as you process it, and deciding what to do next. This is a very interactive flow. Uh, let me speed this up for you. Yeah. So if you were here last year, you might know this, because this is the famous trams example. We are basically trying to provide a live feed of all the trams in Krakow. Uh-huh. And once we do that, we can collapse it into one function and then schedule it to run, say, every second to refresh the location of the trams. See, every three seconds, run the function, and there you have it. 
Okay, so, so, so to sum summarize this, this approach, uh, we have a clear pipeline <coughs> as we process the data. We have manageable complexity because we can view the graph on different levels or in the code if you want the, the, the finest granularity. Uh, this, in, in our opinion, this, this improves correctness of the programs and this increases developer productivity. Uh, and the communication between technical, non-technical teams, even inside the teams, is actually backed by the compiler, which creates the visual representation. Uh, okay, so to see how we combined Luna and serverless, let me hand this, the mic over to my colleagues. Hi. Uh, so we decided to leverage Luna features to manage uh, this complexity behind serverless. Uh, because uh, even the toughest hearts might tremble uh, when they see uh, the spaghetti of callbacks and uh, functions intertwined in a complex program. Uh, well, we believe Luna is uh, the best solution for this because of the graph you saw before. And when you look at the asynchronous function, such as reading a file, uh, it doesn't return immediately because you have to read it from the hard disk and also it can fail, it can be a power failure, anything. You have to handle all this uh, stuff, the bad stuff that can happen. And when you have a remote function, uh, it needs uh, to call the AWS Lambda, it has to go through uh, the network, so you need to also wait for it and you have to handle the case uh, when the function fails. So, uh, you probably know the future type from Java or Scala, uh, and we believe uh, both of those uh, examples can be abstracted away using a future type, which represents uh, just a value that's not there yet. And incidentally, uh, we believe the future may be expressed as a monad, where return is just an empty computation and uh, just wrapping uh, something in the future and bind is a flat map, so it's uh, registering a computation on the value which will arrive in the future or in case when it doesn't arrive we just have a failed computation. So in ideal world we believe we should be able to execute those remote functions the same way we execute local functions and the only thing that's different is uh, that they will be in different monad, let's call it a serverless monad, uh, so the developer will know they are built for it, <laughs> it's quite important thing, uh, but they shouldn't uh, really have to uh, manage the cognitive uh, load uh, <coughs> connected with managing those remote functions. So what we made, uh, what you may see, the code name for the project was Thestral because it takes Luna to the clouds. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Piotrek suggested it sounds like a medicine so we just stuck with Luna serverless framework. Uh, <laughs> And uh, basically, uh, when you want to start, many developers are scared of uh, using serverless because of the configuration needed, because of all those stuff they can just uh, omit when they write a regular program. So what we did is we took away that responsibility. You just call AWS init and set your role so that you have permission, uh, you have credentials for AWS and everything is set up for you. If you want to change something, you can just override it. Uh, you have this object that's created and you can call functions setting different uh, parts of the configuration. So when you define a function, we also wanted it to be as similar to defining a regular function. Uh, in this example, we use just JavaScript code. Uh, Luna code is not supported yet, but we'd really love to use just uh, Luna code to deploy a remote function. Uh, so what we do? We write a code, we write a signature, and create a function. So just regular stuff you always do when you create a new function. And what Luna uh, allows you to do is just collapse all these things into a single node uh, so that you forget about everything that happens inside. You just have this function and you can uh, do whatever you want with it. 
and what you want to do is probably invoke it. That's what we usually do with functions. And invocation of a function is nothing simpler than passing arguments. In this example, the arguments are in JSON because that's the simplest way AWS Lambda handles uh, those requests so that you have a function written in JavaScript, you have arguments in a JSON, and we have two flavors, which one of which is synchronous, but you have to waste time to wait for the network for the response to come. And the asynchronous, which returns a future result, as I mentioned earlier, you can really make a great composable pipeline, uh, which is the one of the main uh, features of functional programming, so that you have uh, you can easily compose the parts of the program even the asynchronous ones. And the return value is, uh, here is the asynchronous example. Here we have flat map, which uh, extracts the payload from the response because uh, we don't have to wait for it to register a computation on the result. Uh, and we also had some utilities uh, because you have to create a function on the AWS only once and then you just call it. So uh, you might want to fetch those functions. You may want to delete this function, uh, change permissions and stuff. Uh, to tell the truth, the full API is really long. You can do lots of stuff. But what we did is just a proof of concept. We believe uh, maybe in the future, uh, tag resource will be needed by someone, uh, so we'll uh, let them have it, but uh, not right now. And uh, Lucas, please <coughs> take it away. Right, I will talk a bit about how we implemented all this under the hood and about the problems we have encountered in the way. Uh, so the first choice we had to make was where, well, how do we actually in our uh, tech stack, we want to place our framework? And we ended up with just writing the framework directly in Luna. Uh, it's then uh, executed by Haskell Runtime, uh, and Haskell Runtime uses Amazon Colibri. Um, in this version, it might be more uh, visible. Uh, yeah, and uh, at the bottom, I've also included a foreign function interface here. What's going on? Um, well, the choice we had to make uh, w was whether we want to use like C library to interact with AWS uh, or some other solution. And initially we prototyped with uh, C libraries uh, because we want to kind of decouple uh, the framework from Luna standard library. Uh, but it turned out that, well, such decoupling proved uh, problematic when it came to distributing over uh, different platforms uh, because for each one you would have to build a different library, basically. So, so in the end, we've settled with uh, Haskell uh, Amazon Library, which was slightly more coupled to the uh, to the Luna's standard library, but allowed us to like seamlessly distribute over all platforms at once, just using Haskell stack. So it was kind of nice. It turned out that the Amazon Library is pretty awesome. Basically, uh, it supports like majority if not all of the public uh, AWS endpoints. And it, like, it's much more simpler to use than basically C or C++ tooling for AWS. So it's kind of point for functional programming. Right, and about the future monad, what, what are we actually abstracting out? Uh, well, while performing requests to AWS, we need to keep our state to match requests with responses uh, and thread our computation so that we can do some other work while waiting. So we're abstracting just uh, the Haskell's MVARs and creating forks. But the user, well, as you've seen before, you don't really have to know nothing about those concepts. You just change, <laughs> you just change computations uh, using simple flat map. Right, uh, going on to performance. It was not actually our goal, but we wanted to see uh, how the thing we have built behaves when we're actually using it. Um, so uh, we kind of, well, testing performance. We set up a very simple test, but just uh, one remote function and uh, called it, 
from multiple threads at once, see how it scales and how it behaves under load, and to see just if we're not doing anything like very wrong. And at the beginning, we've uh, like invoked this AWS function on the local client, and well, this thing happened. So the yellow uh, trace is just the node invocations, which kind of it, it just shows that AWS scales basically. Uh, but this kind of strange uh, strange values for for Luna and Haskell. Uh, well, we were wondering what what was this, what what caused this, and the two culprits we identified might have been um, the network stack actually, and the default configuration of the network stack, uh, and sometimes the uh, the the timeouts, uh, the increase in time for for performing the requests uh, resulted from like DNS. Uh, server errors, which was kind of unexpected, but it turned out that it's because uh, built-in Haskell stack on which Luna is based just creates slightly different uh, pattern of requests than the, the default node stack. So uh, after, after identifying this problem, we uh, set up a, a new client with more stable network conditions on AWS EC2 instance. And in this case, basically, as you can see, there is practically no difference uh, when it comes to invoking uh, so many functions. Uh, but what does it actually show? It just shows that uh, the thing, the, the tools you use to build your program just don't really influence how the program behaves. You only need to care about uh, the, the computational cost uh, of performing of of running the program on a sorry <laughs> uh, of running the program on AWS like uh, this this graph has two two main parts in the first part there is a slow uh, slowly increasing cost of like spinning up the computation on the AWS and later it's actually a uh, slightly more uh, upwards curve that uh, shows this basically. CPU bound of, of the client on which we were performing requests. AWS was able to just kind of scale, but our client just didn't hand, couldn't handle all the responses at once. So it was actually a good sign that we're doing uh, nice work with our tooling. And yeah, we've also set up a Google Cloud client to see like how similarly stable network conditions, but uh, in a different place, uh, change the game. And it turns out that. Actually, there is, there is a constant increase in, in the first part because it's just the network round trip time. So basically, uh, those, are, those, the, the, those are the two main problems we've encountered, the network and its configuration. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, traversing the tech stack of a, a not really mature technology. <laughs> And what we would like to do in the future? Well, it would be nice to, do, to um, support uh, different cloud providers than AWS, like Microsoft Azure. Um, also, call functions directly in Luna uh, with typed arguments. And possibly, you could also like, analyze how the graphs created in Luna uh, correspond to uh, concurrent computation uh, calculi. All right. Right, so just a few closing remarks. Um, we acknowledge that it's still a long way to go until the serverless functions, the remote functions, are truly first class citizens in our programs and are indistinguishable from like async functions. Uh, but we see serverless and functional programming as a promising match. Uh, those two paradigms really play well together. And we do think that visual solutions are really needed for serverless computations because, well, they, they, they let us pretty much handle most of the cognitive problems with serverless computations and most of the, most of the complexity. And I think that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh,
Yeah, so we have time for some questions. Okay, I know if we are hungry and gonna go to for lunch, but still. Uh, Thanks for talk. Your solution looks pretty neat, but uh, how it compares to uh, Microsoft Flow and F Sharp on other functions? I must say, I have no idea. Uh, never used what, what you just mentioned. Uh, we compared it to things like AWS Step Functions, which don't give you the same level of interactivity as our solution does. Uh, so most of the solutions I've seen are about you know, creating some large configuration, clicking or, or writing a huge JSON file, and then they allow you to visualize how the functions interact. We actually do the the step backwards as well. So, I don't know. This I don't know. Uh, because uh, there are tools uh, used uh, specifically for AWS Lambda, but uh, most of them ju are just textual tools which allow you to uh, change the configuration. And there are tools uh, which visualize the process, but they do not let you deploy it. So we connected those. We have a visualization which is fully interactive, and also it allows you to create a working program. So uh, this doesn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> Thank you. One more question. Yeah, if not. We should thank our speakers again.